The name of the lesson this morning is a picture of a godly father. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a man knows he's a man and is proud of it, but at the same time, he has a soft and tender heart that is sensitive to others and the spirit of God. I'm talking about a man of God. I'm talking about the fatherhood, the way it should be. And I want us to look at a picture of this kind of man, and we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 7 and reading verse 7 through 12. But we prove to be among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as to not to be a burden to any of you, we bring to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devotely and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. Just as you know how we are exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So and that is Paul talking there. So in these verses, I think we get a good picture of what fatherhood should be like. And as we look at this, um, just want to pick out four different things, four different traits and they're in here about being a godly father. So the first one, being a godly father means loving your children dearly. So notice what Paul says, verse eight, having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become very dear to us. So here, uh, he is talking, and it's a term that would have been used to describe, uh, or translation would mean, we loved you so much, we cared so much for you, we felt so strongly about you. So it's a term that you might have used to describe the father holding his child. And then, do you remember the first time you held your first child? That's one of the most important things I think in all the ways if you are a father, that first child and holding it for the first time. And then back in the day, I can remember, I know here at the hospital, um, when the children were born, it wasn't what it was today. Father sat out in the waiting room with everybody else. And the mother went through all the pain and the suffering and stuff by herself. And then they brought the baby out and brought the father and said, oh, you've got a son, you've got a daughter or something. And then uh, they kept it behind glass in the nursery. And you'd go up to the window and peek through the nursery glass to see the baby or whatever. You wasn't as part of it as you are today. Today, it's completely different from what it used to be. So, but... Once you had that chance to uh, hold baby for the first time, a lot of us were very nervous because, you know, even that's our baby, the first time holding it, you know, and then mom, hold its head, support it, hold it back, hold it just right, make sure, you know, you've got everything just right here, cuddle it and everything. So, but eventually that all came to you as being a father and a mother. You knew how to care for that baby if you hadn't before. So that was sometimes an awkward experience. And then we enjoyed it. We enjoyed holding our children, expressing our love, enjoyed playing with them, watching them laugh, 
comforting them when they hurt, watching them grow up. But then what happens? They grow up. They're not that baby anymore. They grow up to be teenagers. Yeah. Just about the time you think you're getting good at it, marrying and changing the diapers and all that, and they'll feeding and they're growing up. Then all of a sudden you have new changes to worry about. Been through it. Good luck. But fathers, don't ever be afraid to hug your children and tell you tell them that you love them. I know sometimes, you know, as parents, we're concerned about how our kids are going to make it this world. But with our teaching and with our showing them, uh, hopefully they'll make the right choices. And so the point is, fathers, don't be afraid to show your affection. Our best example of fatherhood, of course, is our father in heaven. And probably one of the best stories to show our father's love, of course, is the story, the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. The reason that we can relate to this story is everybody experiences as a teenager what the prodigal son experienced, where we came to the point where we think we know more than our parents do. We think we got the cat by the tail. We think we know it all. We put it all figured out. But you know the story. The son goes off into a far country, squanders all the money that was given to him by the father, and he runs out of money. He runs out of friends, and he ends up in a pig pen, eating the slop that's being fed that he's feeding to the pigs. This is one of the most humiliating places that I think you could be at any given point in your life. As he sits there, Jesus said he came to himself, and he starts thinking, how many of my father's servants have plenty of food, and here I am starving to death. I will get up and go back to my father. But notice something. The prodigal son felt that he could go back to his father. The relationship, relationship might never be the same again, but he knew the door was open. How did he know that? It was obvious that all through the time of raising his son, the father had communicated his love. He had conveyed to him the message, no matter how far you go, you can always come back home again. That kind of love is a vital thing that we need to communicate to our children. So the prodigal son said, I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And that was probably the speech that he was practicing all the way back from the far land and coming back to his father. But before he could even get the first words out, his father ran out to him, threw his arms around him, and hugged him and kissed him. He wasn't afraid to express his love for him. So as fathers, we need to make sure we communicate to our children, no matter what happens, that there will always be a father waiting to throw his arms around them and to assure them of their constant love. They need to know that we love them dearly. Number two, being a godly father means being a hard worker. Paul said, we are ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our, our own selves. He says, when we worked in Thessalonica, we didn't just stand up and preach. That would be easy. We did far more than that. We poured our and our lives into taking care of your needs. And then in Ephesians 5 and 25, there's an admonition to the men. Now, it's specifically made to husbands, but husbands are fathers. But I think this works well. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Sometimes, 
as men, sometimes we forget the impression that being the head of the family means that you're the one who is served. That everybody does exactly what you want them to do when you want them to do it. Paul says, though, that being the head means you're like Christ, who used his headship to serve in many, many different ways that was needed. If someone needed their feet washed, what did Jesus do? Jesus was willing to get down and wash those feet. Humiliation. But he was willing to do whatever he needed. And the Apostle Paul was also willing to go to great lengths to provide for these Christians whom he considered his children in the faith. And in verse 9, it says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work day, night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So Paul was saying, we're willing to make sacrifices to make things easier here. We could have had you support us, but we chose not to do that. We worked extra hard so there would be no burden on you. So what a beautiful spirit of sacrifice that ought to be a trait of every Christian father. But don't misunderstand me. Your children don't need material things in place of your time. They don't need to see the fruit of their father's labor instead of seeing their father. But they do need to see a father who does a day's work for a day's pay. And this is where this is one for me. Is when I was a father, I wasn't a Christian. But I am now, so I can be for my children. I can be for my grandkids. And I worked, worked many hours, and wasn't there for them a lot of times. But I am now and trying to make up for it. So if her kids don't see a father who is a hard worker and who has a good work ethic, chances are they'll never learn it for themselves. They always, kids, no matter how young they are and how old they are, can see you and see what's going on. Uh, James Dobson wrote, we're so concerned about giving children what we didn't have when growing up that we neglect to give them what we did have. Maybe we didn't have material things, but we did have appreciation of the value of things and the willingness to work for it. And things have changed so many, so much since then. As fathers, we have a responsibility to teach a good work ethic to our children, to provide for their needs, and to be willing to sacrifice for them when necessary. <clears throat> Number three, being a godly father means living out your faith. In verse 10, Paul says, you are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. Paul is saying, when we were with you, we lived holy lives, we were righteous, we lived out our faith, we were blameless. You couldn't point at anything we did and say that it was wrong or that we didn't do what we should have done. He also says here, you know how we live. You saw how we lived. Christianity wasn't just something we talked about. It was something we put into practice in our lives. So as men and fathers, we so often misplace our vision, our focus sometimes on houses, cars, stock portfolios, bank accounts, or as they say today, the man with the most toys wins and they're in things of the world and things uh, but if or if you had a financial plan if i tucked away enough money for college or if i have a good life insurance policy you know you're being a good provider 
So those things there. But we revert, we revert to the things we can see when in fact it's the unseen world, the world of the spirit, the world of relationships where we ought to be make, majoring in our provision. Matters of character, heart, spirit, integrity, justice, humility, the kind of things that last, the character traits that outlive a man. Fathers, you may be concerned about what kind of inheritance you're going to leave your children, but God is more concerned with what sort of legacy you're going to leave them. And that goes back to talking about, like out here in the cemetery in these headstones and stuff, you see, you see a date when you're born, and you see that dash in the middle, and you see that date at the end. It's not so much the date you're born or the date you passed away, but, but it's that dash in the middle. What did you do with your life while you were here on earth? How did you uh, live it? How did you show each other? How were you uh, living out what God wanted you to do? So I'm sure you thought it realized that God has given you the responsibility of being the spiritual leader in your home. And you're the spiritual leader of your home, whether you realize it or not. Or whether you want to be or not. And as a leader in your home, you will either lead your family closer to God or lead them further away. As spiritual leaders, it is responsibility as fathers to show where the focus of our life is. That our Christianity is not just something for Sunday mornings, but something that we live out all week long. Fathers, it's essential that your children hear the story of the gospel. And it's even better if it comes from you. But they need even more than that. They need to be able to see that you live it out in your daily life. They need to see how you handle your finances, how you make decisions, what your values are, what makes you laugh. They need to hear you admit when you're wrong. And they need you to see they need to see you stand up for your faith. So if I come to church, carry my Bible on a Sunday morning, and then when I go home, don't open the Bible at all through the week, your kids will know. They're watching. They're learning. They know. If you pray here on Sunday mornings when everybody else is praying, but you never pray at home, your kids will know that too. If you never worship God through the week or if you aren't a very good steward of what God has blessed you with, your children will see that. But our kids do know what we do when at home. You can be one person when you go to work, another person when you come to church, and another person out in society. But when you go home and kick off your shoes and sit in your recliner, you become what you really are inside. What do our kids see? So it's absolutely essential that we are genuine in our faith, that our children see not only us worship God, but we worship at home, that we read the word, that we pray, and that they see the genuineness of our faith. They see how being a Christian affects the decision we make every day. Then, as an example here, one that said, after a funeral of an elderly man, a couple of his friends from church were sitting around the kitchen table visiting with his four grown children. One of them asked, what do you children remember most about your dad? All four of them began telling some of their memories, but the first thing they all mentioned was they remembered their mom and dad kneeling beside the bed and praying together every night. That was their first memory. One of the men said, do you realize how special that is? There were so many children who never, ever see their parents kneel and pray. What they saw in their father was a man who not only talked about God, but who walked God and left a legacy for his children to pick up and carry forward and to adopt it in their own lives. They then in turn can pass on to their children as well. And then another example, 
a group of first graders was asked to draw a picture of God in their Sunday school class. Their pictures contain some interesting thoughts. One child depicted God in the form of a brightly colored rainbow, talking you know, about the rainbow and Noah and everything. Another presented him as an old man coming out of the clouds. Things they'd been taught. One little boy drew God with a remarkable resemblance to Superman, you know, being that great person that's man. But the best one, though, came from one little girl. She said, I didn't know what God looked like. So I just drew a picture of my daddy. So wouldn't it be wonderful if our children were able to see God living in our lives to that extent? Number four, being a godly father means training your children. So in verse 11 here, Paul says, for you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So Paul here, when we were with you, we made every effort to encourage you, to comfort you, to challenge you, because that's what a father does. He encourages, he comforts, challenges children to live lives worthy of God. And we do it with the hope of having children who grow up to walk worthy of God. John wrote in 3 John verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. I believe that whole heart. It is said that uh, Abraham Lincoln never paid more than a common courtesy to adults when he passed them on the streets. But whenever he passed a child, he would step out of the way and tip his hat. He said, these adults I know, but who knows what these children may become. These little ones here in the room today, squirming, crying, whatever it is, these are our greatest potential for this church. And I don't want any Nathan, Jess, Erica, and Trevor, anybody, anyone with these little kids, if they make any noise or they do anything, I relish that. You have them here, they're here to learn God and grow up in the church and hopefully there'll be other leaders. So don't think for a minute that any of us are, you know, anything they do. Then the last example here, uh, one tribe of uh, Native Americans, they have a unique practice for training their braves, their young braves. On a night of a boy's 13th birthday, he was placed in a dense forest to spend the entire night alone. Until then, he had never been away from the security of his family or the tribe. But on this night, he was blindfolded and taken miles away, not knowing where he was going. When he took off the blindfold, he was in the middle of the thick woods by himself all night long. Every time a twig snapped, he visualized a wild animal ready to pounce. Every time an animal howled, he imagined a wolf leaping out of the darkness. Every time the wind blew, he wondered what more sinister should it mask. No doubt it was a terrifying night for many. After what seemed like an eternity, the first rays of sunlight entered the interior of the forest. Looking around, the boy saw flowers, trees, and the outline of the path. Then to his utter astonishment, he beheld the figure of a man standing just a few feet away, armed with a bow and arrow. It was the boy's father. He had been all night. I think that's the most beautiful picture of the role we have as fathers. We prepare our children to be strong, be courageous, to stand on their own, but we're still right there, ready to take care of them in any way that we need to. 
And I think that's definitely a beautiful picture of what God does for us as our Father. He's always there, ready to meet our every need, even when we're not aware of his presence. And what God wants from us is what every father wants from his children. To see that smile, to have those arms wrapped around his neck, to hear those words, I love you. When I grow up, I want to be just like you. So in conclusion this morning, I just want to encourage the fathers to possibly grow in any of these four areas, showing your love and affection to your children, working hard to provide for them and being willing to sacrifice for them, and showing Jesus Christ in the way you live day by day, and in teaching and encouraging your children to grow in their love for God. I just want to wish happy Father's Day to each one of you. Hopefully this has helped you and helped us that we may be able to be better fathers as upcoming. And at the end of the lesson, we give a invitation that anybody, if you're not a Christian, that if you'd like to be a Christian this morning, we invite you to come forward. Baptism is open. If you'd like to be baptized, or if you are a member of the church and you have troubles or trials or you need the prayers of the church, also, if you'd like to come forward at this time.